All right, assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you all. I pray everyone is doing great. I want to welcome you all to our weekly Islam 101 class. Uh, thank you all very much for taking time out on this beautiful, sh 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 really quickly, really quickly. I want to thank you all very much for taking time out on this beautiful Sunday and joining us, inshallah. Uh, God willing, I uh, do appreciate it. Uh, inshallah, if you haven't as of yet, please make sure to get some snacks and drinks there in the back. And this is a class, as most of you probably know, uh, we try to take a topic and have a little discussion about it as well, as, as much as we can. Different from Friday, Friday's open QA session, right? Coffee with the Sheikh. This is a bit more structured in that we have a topic and we go over that topic. So again, welcome to everyone. Thank you all very much for taking time out uh, on this beautiful day. With us, we have with us our dear Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Jibril Spate. Sheikh Jibril, of course, is no uh, stranger to our community. Uh, he's the chaplain of Muslim life at Chapman University in beautiful city of Orange. Uh, he's also doing a lot of different work, uh, alhamdulillah, with IOK, Institute of Knowledge, and, and I'm sure other places as well. And of course, a blessing that he has uh, that I like to always share is that uh, Sheikh Jibril, of course, uh, converted to Islam many, many years ago, studied abroad, lived there for a number of years, alhamdulillah, 20 years, right, Sheikh? Makkah? 20 years, alhamdulillah, and now he's back and he's been supporting our program. So uh, it's our honor and privilege to always have Sheikh Jibril with us. He's going to be covering a very important topic. I'm going to have Sheikh Jibril just uh, elaborate on that. And then, of course, at the tail end of the conversation, we'll go ahead and field any questions or uh, anything of that nature, inshallah. So without further ado, we wanted to make sure Sheikh Jibril gets caffeined up before his uh, discussion here today, <laughs> along with the tres leches uh, muffin there as well. All right, alhamdulillah. Sheikh Jibril, thank you so much for taking time out, and the floor is all yours. All right, you're fine. Assalamu alaikum. All right. <clears throat> In the name of Allah, in the name of God, the Lord of mercy, the bestow of mercy, praise only belongs to him. And may peace and blessings be upon the one who's been sent as a mercy to all of creation, our leader and our master, Muhammad, and upon his family, his companions, and those that follow them excellently until the day of recompense, the day of judgment. For the next few sittings, um, and people are going to come and go as they please, obviously, I understand that. Um, but if you, uh, I would encourage you to consider um taking some notes if you will because this is supposed to be like a i know jamal calls it like a topic and then there's like a classy type thing so i uh am going to structure it like that inshallah ta'ala we're in and we're going to take a deep dive into uh, a particular uh, prophetic tradition and uh, we're going to uh, do the best we can to um really uh unlock a few things from it and the reason why i'm doing that <clears throat> first of all is because upon understanding this particular uh prophetic uh narration it's my hope that no matter where you are you'll be able to uh recall this uh, particular narration as far as your growth as a muslim I think that's probably the main reason why we're doing this. So, uh, All right. Today, there are some important questions I'd like for you to consider thinking about. And each and every time we get together, there'll be some main questions I want you to think about <clears throat> uh, for yourself. First question is, what are Gabriel's te teachings? Gabriel Jibril, alayhi salam, may peace be upon him. <clears throat> Second is, what is the meaning of Islam? And before you get insulted by that question, don't be, okay? There's a reason why, there's a method to my madness. Just you have to be patient though. That's part of the etiquette of being a student is that uh, you have to be patient with your teacher. Sometimes they do stuff that just seems uh, kind of silly or ridiculous but sometimes there's a method to the madness. So it's not madness, but it's a method to what I'm doing, inshallah. 
<laughs> what is the Quran and what's his role in Islam? And that's the third question. Fourth question, who is the messenger of God, Muhammad? Peace and uh, blessings, peace be upon him. And what made Islam's message convincing during his time period? What made Islam convincing during his time period? Seems pretty straightforward. Maybe it is, maybe it's not, I don't know. Now, the first thing is about Gabriel's teachings. I would like for those students, for those who are going to be coming, uh, and you can stomach being around me for every for once a month, I'd like for you to, um, and I will give a PDF version to Brother Jamal for him to have. I would like for you to have the following narration, which is the following. Omar ibn al-Khattab, may God be pleased with him, said that one day when we were, were with Allah's messenger, a man with intense white clothing and very black hair came up to us. No travel, no mark of travel was visible on him. And none of us recognized him. Sitting down before the prophet, leaning his knees, uh, leaning his knees against his and placing his hands on his thighs, he said, tell me, Muhammad, about Islam. Tell me, Muhammad, about Islam. And then the prophet answered by saying that Islam means you should bear witness that there is no God but God. And Muhammad is Allah's messenger or God's messenger. <clears throat> Perform their ritual prayer, pay the alms tax, fast during Ramadan, and make pilgrimage to the house if you can. Then... The man said, you have spoken the truth. We were stunned at his questioning, questioning him, and then declaring that he had spoken the truth. Then the man said, tell me about Iman or faith. And then it was replied that Iman or faith means you have belief in, in God or Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers in the last day, and that you have belief in the divine decree, both good and evil. Then the man goes on and says, you have spoken the truth. And then he asked the messenger, tell me about what is doing or what, tell me about doing what is excellent or beautiful. And then the messenger goes on and says, it means to worship Allah or God as if you see him. For even though you don't, even though you do not see him, he sees you as a misprint, mistyping. But even though you don't see him, he sees you. Then the man said, tell me about the hour. And the prophet said, about that he who was questioned knows no more than the questioner. In other words, the prophet doesn't know. The prophet doesn't know. As a quick tangent today, uh, Jamal, you had asked me about uh, today's class, Tafsir class. So one of the things that we talked about was in the 70th uh, chapter of Surah, in the Quran, and uh, we discussed, amongst other things, how the uh, how the pagan Arabs uh, mocked the idea of an impending punishment and the coming of the hour, because they considered that to be far fetched. And Allah said, "However, we know the timing of it to be very close." However, we know the timing of the coming of the hour to be very close. And in fact, in the Quran, it mentions that it is closer than the blink of an eye. It is closer than the blink of an eye. Now, uh, that means it's pretty close. So anyway, uh, going back to that, so the prophet didn't know, but he was asked about the, about the hour, and the prophet asked, uh, asked the man who asked him in the masjid or the mosque, what have you done to prepare yourself for that coming time period? And the man said, look, I haven't done a lot of prayer. I haven't done additional prayer. I haven't done additional fasting. I haven't done additional charity. I haven't done any additional pilgrimage. But I do, I do love um, Allah and his messenger. And then the prophet said to him, then you will be with those whom you love. And then after that, uh, the narrator, Anas, uh, who used to be around the prophet and serve him, who narrated this, said that after we heard the prophet make that statement that you'll be with those whom you love, that was the happiest thing we ever heard after accepting Islam. Anyway, 
No, the prophet goes on and says about being questioned about the coming of the hour. <clears throat> so I don't know, basically. So then the man said, tell me about its signs. And then the man said, uh, prophet said, the slave girl will give birth to her master. And you will see the barefoot, the naked, the destitute, and the shepherds competing with each other in building. And then the man went away. After I, and it was Omar, the narrator, after I had waited for a long time, the prophet said to me, do you know who the questioner was, Omar? And I, and it was Omar, replied, Allah or God and his messenger know best. And then the prophet said, he was Gabriel. He came to teach you your religion. So I hope that all of you, after I send this off as a PDF to Brother Jamal, that you will reread this and try to memorize it, as a matter of fact. And try to memorize it to the best of your ability, because my whole set of lectures are going to be circled around this particular um, prophetic narration. All right. So Gabriel's teachings consist of what is Islam? Submission. What is uh, Iman or faith? And what is uh, Ihsan or I-H-S-A-N? In other words, what is excellence and beauty? And then after that, what are the signs of the hour? Four things that were asked, four teachings. What is submission? What is faith? What is acting excellently or beautifully? And what are the signs of the hour? Four teachings that we get from this. Four teachings that we get from this. And all of this consists of you and my religion. So far, so good. So far, so good. Good. All right. All right. All right. So what is Islam? Now, if you were to give a quick summary of what is Islam, <clears throat> you can say the following. This is what I say. Islam is an Arabic word that means submission to God's will. And more specifically, it designates the religion established by the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. That's what Islam is. This is what we should be telling everybody. And when a person does that, when a person, a Muslim, is one who has submitted to God's will, following the original religion of Islam, and that was following the Quran huh? and the way of the Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Furthermore, the Quran is a book that uh, God revealed to Muhammad by means of the angel Gabriel. Thus, if a person wants to understand Islam, what do they need to try to study? Huh? The Quran. There you go. That's it. Number one. If a person wants to, Muslim or non Muslim. Muslim or non Muslim. As I'm saying this as well, because we're online, there may be some non-Muslims who may be listening. Some of you or all of you probably already know this, but it's good to reinforce this understanding to everybody. That if, you, if a person wants to understand Islam, even if they don't accept Islam, they need to take time out to try to have a better engagement with uh, this. Well, we live in a time period where, unfortunately, reading has become not fundamental. Reading has become not fundamental. Remember that bus that used to say reading is fundamental? Remember that? <laughs> oh, man. All right. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the Quran, inshallah. Um, <clears throat> there are six things here and I can try to cover, inshallah, for the day. I got to finish at 2.30, so I'll do the best I can. Nah. <laughs> I know you, man. But don't try, try to be slick, man. Come on, bro. Come on, man. This brother right here, he was like, I see how he was walking, man. Yeah, because I, I, sometimes you got to do that sometimes. Let people know, don't mess with me, man. I'm, I'm going to be, I mean, you know. I'm a nice, I'm a humble brother, but you know, don't try and play no game on me, man. I got on top of the three card, Monty, man. Don't do that to me, man. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. The Quran, as we all know, um, is in Arabic, okay? Fine. And in it, it consists of historical and uh, social circumstances that have been revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, okay? 
And oh, we have to remember that the Quran is the, is the divine word in its Arabic form. And that being that it's in its Arabic form, that means that every single word conveys a certain type of meaning. It conveys a message. So the Quran is in Arabic and translations are interpretations. All right, whether it be in English or in Spanish or even Persian. That was the first set of, uh, by the way, Persian was the first language wherein the Quran was translated, just so you know as a side note. Now, with regards to, you know, interpretation, bear in mind that you're going to get various, various interpretation. Some bring out the spirit of what the, of the Quranic message and some deviate from it. And that's something as well that I'd like for you to take into consideration as you are talking about and internalizing what Islam is. Regardless, um, the thing about it is that it is a message. And the message of the Quran doesn't care about what people think about it. The message of the Quran doesn't care about what people think of it. That's a very important point because oftentimes people have biases when they look at something like the Quran and then they expect something. And then when they open it up and start reading, perhaps their biases are challenged or perhaps their biases um, causes them to uh, um, reject or consider things in the Qur'an to be far-fetched because they have an expectation. Well, the Qur'an is here to say to you that, you know what, we don't care about your expectations, okay? This is what we expect from you. All right. Um, now, because of the diversity in uh, translations and interpretations, which is going to happen, bear in mind that there is a unity with the Qur'an as a unified message. And also there is a unity with respect to Muslims, meaning that we Muslims are required to read the Qur'an, the Fatiha, the opening chapter in Arabic. That's where the unity comes in. So there's a diversity in translation. There's a diversity in interpretation. There's a diversity in understanding, which is acceptable to, an assert, to a certain extent. And at the same time, within the Quran, there is a sense of unity from the standpoint that every Muslim has to recite the opening chapter in its Arabic form. And at least, and, and, and of course, has to learn when they convert to Islam, uh, how to uh, recite that ultimately. That's the unity. So, translations are very significant because it gives the person a glimpse into what this Semitic language Arabic has to say. All right. It also, it also gives a glimpse as to how God wants us to transform our human nature or to revitalize our human nature. Now I bring this up because oftentimes when people convert to Islam and they hear about the Arabic and everything, they feel a little bit discouraged. So I'm here to tell you that, yes, it's very good for you to try to learn to the best of your ability, but translations also are a blessing from the standpoint that it gives a, a glimpse as to what is the message and what is demanded from God to us and the means of trying to transform ourselves from something to something better. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So with that being said, I hope that this gives you something to think about as we, as we move forward. Um, some other things as well to think about with regards to the Quran is with regards to the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. If you look at 
um, if you look at the Quran itself, you will find that its length is probably um, the size of the New Testament. And the current printing is approximately 600 pages, a little bit more than the New Testament, maybe about the same size. And it's divided, that is the Quran, um, into what they call surahs, S-U-R-A-H, surahs. And I don't like the word chapter. Surah, for those of you taking notes, refers to literally a fence or an enclosure or a part of a structure. The shortest surah has about 10 words. And the longest um, is placed in the second chapter, the second uh, right after the opening chapter, after the opening, uh, the opening surah. And the Quran has approximately 6,200 words. As we mentioned before, as a reminder, that in general, after the opening uh, surah, it starts with the longest and then descends down as far as size. Bear in mind that the last 60 surahs take up um, about the same amount of space as the entire second surah. So from, uh, yeah, from uh, the 50th surah until the end, all of that is equivalent to the size of the second surah in the Quran. And every surah has what is called an ayah, A-Y-H, A-Y-A-H, uh, which literally means a sign. It's been translated to mean verse, uh, but it means sign. The sign has a message, doesn't it? The sign has a message. And a person who does not recognize the sign who doesn't pay attention to the sign, they usually turn away from the sign, from that message. And when they turn away from that message, something negative could possibly happen to them. Likewise, in the Quran, if they have what they call surahs, 114 of them, and each surah has a, an ayah, that means it has a sign. Each sign is trying to tell you something. Each sign, is trying to tell you and me something. Now, the Quran, of course, has certain things in it that are similar to in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament with possible changes. The Quran as well, as we all know, mentions some very important people, prophets. It mentions Muhammad the most, true or false? False. Very good. Who's mentioned the most? Huh? Musa or Moses. Very good. So if he's mentioned the most, who's his enemy? Huh? Pharaoh. Very good. Pharaoh is his great enemy. Why is it that Allah would mention Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, and his arch enemy the most? What do you think? What's the reason why? Mm -hmm. The deviations of the children of Israel. Yes. Okay. That's good. That's one thing. Good. What's another reason why Moses and Pharaoh mentioned? That's good. The brother was saying that, look, you know, it's a sort of, a, it's a uh, consistency of the message of Moses and to Muhammad. Very good. Huh? What else? Hmm. Prophets are considered the epitome of human decency and good. Is that true or false? True. And Pharaoh is the epitome of human what? Decency or evil? evil? Evil. There you go. All right. Uh, so Allah mentions Pharaoh the most to indicate that this is the, this individual and people like him are the most despicable form of people that ever walked the face of the earth. And there are people like them even today. And y'all should not be like them. 
That's why. Pharaoh um, was the epitome of someone, the Pharaoh of Moses' time, was the epitome of somebody that said, I refuse to submit to God because I'm God. All right, that's why. All right, and because of that, God, Allah keeps mentioning over and over in different places about don't be like this. Right, that's something for us to think about as well. So, Prophet Moses is, is mentioned the most. Adam, Abraham, and Jesus are the others that are mentioned more than Prophet Muhammad um, because these are the epitome of human decency and human good. And they are the epitome of what faith is what really is about. They have personified what faith is really about. And the responsibility of conveying the need for every human being to recapture their human nature, which is submitting to God alone. That's why. I hope you're getting this, inshallah. So we find as well that uh, um, with regards to the issue of the Qur'an as well, it doesn't stop in referring to the prophets. It also breaks down how we should be praying, fasting, and taking care of human relationships as well. Something that is not present in other scriptures. That's what makes it so unique as well. And this leads to the issue of Western scholarship and Islamic worldview. You see, a lot of Western scholars, they have found the Quran to be extremely difficult to appreciate, even in translation. Even those who have studied the Arabic language, read the original, the Quran, you find many of them to declare the Quran to be disorderly and illogical. It is only until recently that you find some Western scholars admitting and accepting the authenticity of the Quran. And prior to that, they were trying to find things wrong with it, but things have changed for the better uh, when it comes to Western scholarship, even though there's still some, some issues there. But at one time, there used to be a, a case where in Western scholarship used to try to really, really, really go after the Quran, even those who went to the Arab lands, try to study Arabic, and they tried to find the illogical nature of the Quran, but they couldn't do it. And so we find that the miracle of the Quran, even amongst Western scholarship, um, is taking place little by little, because Allah has made it clear that uh, nothing, of in nothing invalid will ever come to distort its message. That also means that Western scholarship will never be successful in finding something wrong with it, no matter how hard they try. All right. So what is the Islamic view then? The Islamic worldview then is a submission, right? It is also a means of changing one's life or transforming one's life. Wherein life is based upon God and nothing else. And this is becoming increasingly foreign even to people who live in a country like the United States of America. That is to say that having God as the central focus is becoming increasingly foreign. But the Islamic worldview is to have uh, God be this central focus of any and everything. That includes our devotional ritual worship, as well as our transactions, our marriages, our families, our relationships with our non-Muslim folk, etc. We'll talk a little bit now about the Messenger of God, Muhammad. May Allah bless him and grant him peace. And all of you have studied something about the Messenger of, uh, of God, Muhammad. May Allah bless him and grant him peace. So I won't go too far, but I will discuss something. Firstly, um, there are many books that talk about the Prophet Muhammad. There are many books that talk about uh, Sheikh Mustafa Omar has one. 
And there's some others as well that have talked about uh, the Prophet Muhammad in some depth and some detail. I encourage you to read them and study them. Here's the thing, though. Here's the thing about the Prophet Muhammad that's very important. To understand the life of Prophet Muhammad, you have to study what? The Quran. <laughs> it goes back to the Quran again. All right? To study Muhammad, you got to study the Quran. That's how you understand his life, his seerah, as you say. All right. S E E R A H, the biography. Quickly, Muhammad was born in 570 Common Era into a respected family in the city of Mecca. And during that time period, the Meccans were, of course, they were connected via Arab tribes, as we know. Some lived as nomads or Bedouins. We also know that Mecca was the central point of trading. And of course, it had the Kaaba, the, uh, that ancient cube that was built by first Prophet Adam and then rebuilt by Prophet Ibrahim. All right. During Muhammad's time period, as we all know, the Kaaba was home for a large number of idols representing the gods of Arab tribes. And four months of the year, there was no fighting. It was sacred months. Did you know that we're in a sacred month right now? Did you know that? We're in the 11th month of the Islamic calendar. Fadhu al-Qa'ada. Yes, very good. Or Qa'ada. You can also pronounce it like that. huh? Ancient Arab warfare. This is significant to understand as I talk about this with other people when we talk about the Qur'an. If you want to understand the Qur'an, you got to understand that civilization. So there's history now. Ancient Arab warfare is not like modern warfare. All right. That's the first thing we have to say. In fact, the difference was not domination per se. The difference was that two things would be dominant when Arabs used to fight each other. The culture and the redistribution of wealth. Whenever Arab tribe won and its sub-tribes, then two things would be, would be very important. The domination of that particular culture, because not all Arab cultures were the same, as well as the redistribution of wealth. Otherwise, mass killing and the like was something was, that was not the case when it came to Arab warfare, unlike modern warfare. In fact, there was a there was a uh, code of warfare amongst the Arab war amongst Arabs when they fought each other, unlike today. Despite the Arab warfare, the greatest weapon wasn't their swords and their arrows. The greatest weapon amongst the Arab tribes was poetry, language. Very good. Thank you. All right. And I want you to keep that in mind as we. Wrap this up, inshallah. Now, Muhammad's father, as we know, died before Muhammad was born. His mother died as well when he was uh, six years old. He was raised by his relatives. And like many of his uh, compatriots, uh, he was placed outside of the city limits for some time period to, to be around the nomadic people, to be able to really have a pure understanding of Arabic and to develop very... Uh, good uh, morals and manners until he, he grew up to be part of a respected member of the Meccan community. As we all know, he was known for his honesty, integrity, and his trustworthiness, just like every other prophet. He was a trader and he was a business person. And he used to go to Syria quite often with his uncle. And when he was 25 years old, he married his uh, employer, Khadija, when she was 40 years old. And they lived, they were married for 25 years. We also know that Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was not happy with the way the people, the local tribes were doing their rituals. And they preferred to stay away from them and uh, adhere to the uh, ancient Arab religion of who? Prophet Abraham. And we also know that he used to go to a particular cave, 
hopefully all of you will have a chance to visit that particular cave. It's still there. Um, although it's kind of a climb, I'm going to tell you that right now. When you go, it's quite, it's quite the climb. So I'm going to tell you right now, you got them open heel shoes and whatnot? Don't do that. Don't do that. Make sure you bring some, uh, you bring some hiking shoes or something to climb up the mountains. I'm telling you that right now. And then eventually at 40 years old, we know the messenger received prophecy, the first revelation. And this is alluded to in the Quran, uh, Surah 46, ayah number 15, 46.15. A man reaches full maturity at the age of 40, as is mentioned there. And we also know that the angel Jibril or Gabriel came to him to give him his first words of the Quran. Now, this is when things become interesting. As we all know as well, and this is all background before we dive in, so I want you to be patient with me. And Muhammad, upon receiving the first revelation, he had doubt. He, received, he had some self-doubt about himself. And his support system at that time was Khadija, may Allah be pleased with her, and convinced her husband that he did not lose his mental balance, that he was mentally stable, because he thought that something was afflicting him. And, and a, there was a time period where after the angel came to Muhammad, he didn't come to him for some time. And Muhammad started to, you know, wonder what's going on. And then eventually the angel comes back uh, in full form to begin the continuous uh, revelation to the Prophet Muhammad. Little by little, people began to acknowledge the truth of Prophet Muhammad's message. Um, and his message was simple, that uh, God had chosen him. Listen to me carefully. The first things that he said to his people was that God has chosen me to warn the people of the last judgment. That's the first thing he said to his people. I am your warner. And there is a coming of the hour coming to you. You must accept God's sovereignty over yourselves and fix yourselves before the coming of the hour. That was his message. I'll say it again. This message is real simple. I have come here to warn you people of the last judgment. You must accept God's sovereignty over you. And you must mend or fix your ways. So this meant that they had to what? They had to give. They had to give Almighty God worship. And only to him. And to adhere to the certain moral instructions both individually as well as socially. Now, in our day and age, when we talk to people about these things, some people find it very, very difficult to imagine such a message. However, the Prophet Muhammad presented supporting arguments that many of his temporaries, contemporaries found overwhelming. First of all, the message of language. That's what goes back to the poetry. The language of the divine message, it's ayat or verses, were penetrating to the people. It was beyond awesome, I guess you can say. And no one could call it poetry, although they tried to. Even those that tried to put doubt in the minds of others, they knew that it wasn't poetry. They knew the difference between poetry and non-poetry. The Quran has a poetic style to it, but it's not poetry. And during that time, they understood the difference between the two. And they also understood the power behind the messages that were grasping at the hearts and souls. And this was definitely the case for the Meccan surahs. The Meccan surahs, when they came, they were short, but very, very powerful kind of like the Mike Tyson punch, if you know anything about Mike Tyson. Okay. And so they understood, or the people understood, the followers accepted the message of Muhammad because they understood that this was a living miracle, the Quran that is. So okay, so Muhammad was considered, was recognized as a good man. All right. He was an ordinary man, to be honest with you. Yes, he was considered the trustworthy one. 
And he spoke the pure language of the Arab tribes. But all of a sudden we have this ordinary man suddenly come, stand on a foothill, and then start reciting, start warning the people, reciting text of extraordinary power and beauty. First and foremost, to rejuvenate within the people that they were descendants of Prophet Ishmael, the son of Abraham. Now the people back then, they had recognized that Prophet Abraham was their forefather. However, and even including the Christians and Jews that were there, they recognized the, uh, they recognized the status of Prophet Abraham. However, due to their arrogance, i.e. the Arabs at that time, due to many of the arrogance, they used to consider what was being recited to them to be fairy tales of the ancient or myths that were of yesteryear, if you will. And this is discussed in many parts of the Quran. So what was convincing to the earliest Muslims, the earliest followers, were a combination of things. First of all, the sudden transformation of Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. That he went from being an, an ordinary man to someone now who was granted and chosen to uh, articulate the words of God in a penetrating manner that, that, that shook the very fiber of the people that listened. The eloquence of his language, short yet powerful, and the recognition that this was something they had always known, but they stopped taking seriously. Also, the three reasons why the people, the early Muslims, accepted his message. I'll say them again. Because of Muhammad's transformation, and because of the powerful eloquence of the language of the Quran, and because of the fact that uh, it was meant to revitalize and rejuvenate what they should have been doing in the first place, which is to adhere to their forefathers, their ancestors. Prophet Ishmael and Prophet Abraham. So it was a rejuvenation of that. <clears throat> and that is what was the case with regards to why uh, we find those people accepting it, uh, those small number. Now, the powers that be in Mecca at that time, they thought that uh, Muhammad was a mad person, although they tried to make that claim. And then in the year six. 22 common era, we find that uh, a delegation had come to Prophet Muhammad from the town of Yathrib, 200 miles north of, uh, of Mecca, which is called Al-Madina now, the city, right? And they were looking for a peacemaker because up there they were fighting each other and they viewed Muhammad to be someone who was able to arbitrate and be someone that can bring them together. So... They, uh, they made a pact with him to come to Medina. At that same time period, the powers that be, they had enough of Muhammad's message and they wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill him. And the Quran talks about this in various parts as well, about how people of the past tried to kill the prophets. However, they plan and God plans, and God is the best of planners. In other words, he is the best, he is the one that plots effectively. So he was able to slip out of the city with his companion, Abu Bakr, who eventually would be the first caliph, and this is called the Hijrah, the, the immigration. And this is when we find the new year or the year being established of a calendar that we try to practice today. In 10 years in Medina, the prophet lived there in Medina, and it was there that he consolidated the people. It was the word, it wasn't bloodshed that brought Islam together, but it was the word, the so-called poetic nature of the Quran that brought the people together. Did you know that when the prophet Muhammad went to Mecca, 
for the conquest of Mecca. Did you know that, he, that not one drop of blood was shed? Did you know that? Now you know. He went into Mecca, and the people that were still not Muslim, they recognized that they were defeated, and the prophet was on his donkey with his head down, and then he asked all of them, he said, so, what do you expect for me to do to you? And then they said that, you know, you are the son of a noble person. Who is the son of a noble person? And the prophet said, uh, there is no sin upon all of you. May Allah or may God forgive you, for he is the, the most merciful of all who are merciful. Go back to your homes. Historians, Western and otherwise, have considered that to be, if not the most significant uh, uh, thing uh, in not only warfare, but also with regards to um, one of the most, if not the most important lessons that every single leader can learn when it comes to rules of engagement. That this man did not shed a blood when he came back to Mecca. So he went back to Mecca. And then uh, after that, Islam, so the, the, the message of Islam really flourished. And then we find that ultimately Mecca becomes not a, a city where, um, where no Islam was practiced, but all of Islam was practiced. We also know that the Prophet Muhammad was uh, a prophet. He was a king, if you will. He was the judge. He was a spiritual counselor. He was the leader. He was also a father figure. May God's peace and blessings be upon him. And via the, the revelation, he uh, was guided with political and societal goals. He decided disputes and handed out punishment when necessary, handed out pardons when necessary, he advised people, etc. These are the things that we should take into consideration as far as a background when we start diving into the uh, hadith, the Gabriel hadith, the Gabriel uh, teaching. Lastly, about the Quran itself, the Quran is the eternal word of God. It is uncreated. Unlike uh, Hadith, H-A-D-I-T-H, -H, which are the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, those are different. So I want us to make sure we understand the difference between the two. The Quran is eternal and uncreated, inspired by God to the Prophet to articulate what God said, what Allah said. Whereas hadith is um, something that the Prophet Muhammad said um, and both, while they may be based upon uh, inspiration, um, one is eternal, uncreated, and one is not. All right, that's all I want to do as a quick background. Uh, let's see. Some other things as well. Got about, yeah, we went over time because this is going to come up later on as well. After the prophet died, and peace and blessings be upon him, there was an eventual uh, splitting of the community. First, people refused to pay the alms tax, the zakat, and there was uh, fighting for that. Abu Bakr dies, and then Omar becomes the second caliph, and then he was assassinated. Uthman, the third caliph, he was assassinated. Um, and then we have Ali after that. Now, within this time period, we start to, not only do we see um, internal turmoil, but we also see partisanship taking place, as there were some people who believed that uh, Ali the prophet's nephew and son-in-law uh, should have been uh, the, the designated leader after the death of Prophet Muhammad. And these people were called Shiite. 
We are not Shiite, we are Sunni. And we'll probably cover that sometime down the road, inshallah, or God willing. But I want to bring it to your attention now because this ties into this whole Gabriel teaching as well, as it talks about history and talks about some of the affairs that would eventually occur that uh, we might touch upon, inshallah, later on. All right. Now that you have all that, next time we get together, we're going to talk about the first thing, which is... Um, the uh, the the coming of Gabriel and what did that signify? And then talk about what is Islam. And we're going to go into some depth about that, talk about Islam and uh, um, talk about the concept of, of there is no God but God, the Shahada, and other things as well, inshallah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Thank you. That was our introduction. <laughs> Allah bless you, Sheikh Jabril Spate, uh, Director of Muslim Life at Chapman University. Uh, Sheikhna, is it? Uh, are you okay with questions right now, or do, would you like to stop? I'm always okay with questions. Uh, so I'm just saying, I don't want to take you too much over your, your the time. So let's go ahead and open up uh, the field for some question or the class. Of course, online as well. If you have any questions, go ahead and drop it in the comment section. Do you uh, mind if I have my? Can I? Can I eat? Can I eat? Thank you. Uh, so we'll go to Sister Rhonda first. And I'm then hungry, more Rhonda. Want some food, man? Say what? <laughs> um, Sheikh Jabril, I have two questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, the first one you said that uh, there was Pharaoh and then there was Moses. Mm -hmm. And Moses uh, and Pharaoh, they were arch enemies. But uh, Moses lived to be eight or nine hundred years. Are we talking about one distinct pharaoh? Or are we talking about a pharaoh that lived that long? Uh, I don't know. Well, I don't know. If, are we seeing like all the I pharaohs were pretty? No, no. I don't know how long Moses uh, lived. I know how long Noah lived. Oh, maybe it's know. Noah. I'm sorry. I might be confusing yeah, that. Yeah, I, think I know you, a couple. It's of possible them. you may have uh, yeah. got it. We don't know how long Moses lived, peace be upon him, but we do know Noah lived for 950, okay, excuse Noah. me, 950 years, yes. Okay. Uh, that is mentioned also in the Old Testament or in the Hebrew Bible as well. Okay. But we're not talking about Prophet Noah, we're talking about Prophet Moses. Yes. yes. He came later on. Yeah, I, I, I'm the That's that. okay. And we're talking about here, yeah, as far as the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh during Moses' time. The Pharaoh during Moses' time, because that was a title. Like yeah, President uh, Bush, yeah. President Obama, President uh, who's that? That Bush, Clinton, Bush. Oh yeah, Obama, Trumpy, and then Joey, and then Joey. Yes. And my next question is that you said that the um, during the time of Muhammad, he was upset because the the tribal people went back to their original uh, religion and they, they had it at the They did not go back to their original religion. He was upset with them. He didn't like, he disapproved of that uh, over centuries, they deviated from, they deviated from the teachings of their ancestor, Prophet Abraham and Ishmael, which was that there is no God but God. There's no deity except for God. However, during Muhammad's time period, as you know, there were many idols and they showed veneration, honor, glory, worship, etc., to those idols. And this is what bothered Prophet Muhammad. How is it that we come from this generation? Uh, we come from this lineage of this great man that built this thing, this, this if you want to call it this, um, this temple, if you will, this Kaaba, this cube. How is it that he built this for God alone? For us to worship God alone, and we got all these different idols all around it, and we're giving our sacrifices and our prayers to that instead of to the Creator. This is what bothered Prophet Muhammad, and thus he would leave Mecca and go into the hillside um, outside of Mecca proper, and he would go there and he would do his um, contemplating and thinking about the creation of God. <clears throat> Until ultimately, Prophet, uh, until ultimate angel Gabriel came to him with the first revelation. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Okay, now I didn't have my muffin. I'm going to put something in my mouth. Okay, I'm going to eat something. Okay, Mr. <laughs> Wandy.
somebody? Okay, Sister Elizabeth, and I'll come to Sister Nina. Okay. Would you? Okay. Let me. Uh, since I'm on this side, then I'll come right back. Oops. with you. Run around with the mic. My Lord bless him. Mashallah. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, um, so you said that that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was born in 570 AD. Um, do we know that for a fact, or are we? Uh, know what know, for a fact? Excuse me. His birth year, because we know that he was born in the year of the elephant. But do we know what year that was? And is there well, any hadith about that? Well, um, yeah, you find the overwhelming majority of historians using um, an elaborate formula coming up with the fact that he was born near 570 common era. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we we know we 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 were told that today that um, that um, Khadija, may Allah be pleased with her, was. 40 years old when she married the prophet? Yes. Um, do we know that for a fact? Yes. Okay, because I have, I have um, heard from a YouTube shave, um, Yasir Khadi, <laughs> that, uh, oh, he's a real shave. But I also heard that he, he provided different opinions, backed up with different um, hadiths that she could have, she was older than him, but she could have been anywhere from 25 to the age that you said. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Rami, you have a question? Come on, side. Young Sheikh Rami has a question. Um, to the point, to the point of, um, to the point, to the point about different opinions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Here's the thing, here's my question um, about that, because this whole, I just think about different positions about that, as well as the age of Aisha, has been going around and around and around. Here's my thing, how does that help you grow as a Muslim? Yeah. Issue with maybe uh, I'm not sure his age. No, I'm talking about Khadija. I'm talking about Khadija specifically. For me, I like to think that he wasn't that older than him. That much older than him. You know why we <laughs> think like that? I mean, we may think like that. You know why? Because we're looking at stuff in the 21st century type of paradigm. Why is that so odd or strange that a 40 year old would ask a 25 year old, in other words, a 40 year woman asking a 25 year old man to marry me? I don't see anything weird about that. All right. For some reason, you know, in this time period, we find it also weird, maybe disgusting, I don't know, where a 40-year-old man want to ask a 25-year-old woman to marry, oh, that's nasty. Why don't you marry somebody your age and everything? What's that supposed to mean? Like, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I could see if, you know, you, know, you dig, you dig. I mean, that's what I'm saying. I mean, I mean, look, let me tell you, you know what's more important? You know what's more important? Uh, huh? Her. Forget the age for a minute. You know what's important? The fact that she said, nah, you ain't crazy. Yes. Like you, you dig? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's number one. And number two, she was the number one supporter. Nobody else was around. The first one, exactly. You dig? So that's what I keep saying you dig, but you know what I'm saying. All right. <laughs> 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 he laughing at me. <laughs> Yes, I talk some slang. I mean, you have to excuse me. It's okay. I do this at university too. I, 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 I like to warn all the academics, look, I understand that we have to talk a certain way, but I'm not going to do that sometime because I don't want to. I just let it be known, okay? You know, it's okay. I, I, good. I'm glad. I appreciate you. <laughs> all right. Got, who got something? I'm going to put something in my mouth. Oh, go ahead. Um, 
The young brother want to know, how do we know Islam is the truth? Who want to answer the question? Who want to answer the question? <laughs> All right. Um, Islam is the truth because we, well, we'll say it like this. Number one, we believe that we have been created by God. Number two, he has given us this idea of being alive. He's given us an opportunity to be successful, to be a winner right, in this life and a promise in the hereafter, okay, in the next life. Here's the thing. There's one condition, and that condition is that we uh, show our gratitude to God by saying, you the only one God that I'm going to give my life to in service. And that's what Islam is. And that's why Islam is the truth, all right? That helps you, hopefully, okay? All right. Huh? I can't eat, man. Y'all know me, man. Every time I try to put something on my mouth, y'all be asking me these deep questions, man. <laughs> <laughs> Little man, mashallah, man. He asked me a tough question, man, mashallah. At least he asked that question. I'd rather hear that than somebody asking me, you know, um, why do the women cover? I'm like, yo, man, what kind of question is that, man? That's a superficial question. Why don't you ask me, you know, a question like that? No, real talk, real talk, all right? Real talk. I mean, you, on 91 coming down here, I know it's kind of funny in a way, but it's very rare now. You got a big old sign. Um, the name above all names, Jesus, right? And I was like, man, you know, that was just kind of, uh, I was uh, not offended by that. I actually appreciated it. Because it's good to see somebody out here caring about religion. Because a lot of people don't care about religion no more, unfortunately. So may Allah reward that young brother uh, for asking a deep question like that. Any more questions? You sure? I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> of course. All right. Thank you so much, Sheikh Jibril. Appreciate it. I know I look a little awkward holding this mic. The batteries, of course, went out on that one. That's why we couldn't hear Sheikh Rami's uh, question there, our young Sheikh there, inshallah. Uh, but Sheikh Jabril Spate, as always, uh, may Allah bless you. Thank you so much for fielding the questions. And I want to thank everybody here and online for your support, of course, tuning in and, of course, asking the questions as well, inshallah. A few announcements. We'll call it a session. Uh, first one is I want to thank everyone that came out yesterday. As you guys know, we have our uh, drive through food distribution uh, that we do. Uh, for anyone that needs help, Muslim or otherwise, no problem. And we still, yeah, Sheikh, uh, three years into this, uh, the pandemic, long line still. And some of the volunteers that were here yesterday were are here today. So I just want to say thank you so much for everyone coming out and uh, just giving back, of course, to the community. And people are very thankful. You have people, you know, uh, walk-ins from the local neighborhood coming in. Now they know that this is a place that they can go. And for many of them, maybe it's their first time at a mosque. Imagine the, uh, you know, the impression they're getting, if you will, right, when they come to the mosque and they're getting these services, of course, with smiling uh, faces. So, so thank you all. And again, when those messages go out for volunteer opportunities, try to do your best to jump on as much as you can, if you have the chance, and join us, even if it's for a few minutes here and there. So thank you so much. Uh, number two, I want to remind myself, and by extension, everybody else is coming Friday. We have a big event, of course, and that's uh, the farewell for Sheikh Mustafa uh, Umar, who is, uh, of course, the imam here, the, uh, director of uh, education and outreach and prison outreach. Uh, so, inshallah, we're going to have a really nice time with him uh, this coming Friday, June 10th. Uh, a little kind of getting to know him a little bit more, inshallah, God willing. But also, we're going to have uh, Paca Tacos is going to be here. Paca Tacos, halal Mexican food. Uh, we have uh, Street Dawa, uh, BBQ is going to be here as well. Sweets, tea, all that good stuff. So, it's a time to enjoy and have a good time. And then, of course, have a really nice discussion with Sheikh Mustafa, kind of like talk show style. So I hope everybody takes a moment and joins us. 7.30, the food will start, God willing, inshallah. And then 8.30 will be the, the main event. And we'll do it inside here in the multi-purpose room. And, of course, it's the least that we can do. Sheikh Mustafa has been here about 10 years and helping the community. Alhamdulillah, all thanks to Allah. So if you guys can take some time out, you and your families, and join us, it'll be uh, amazing, inshallah. And then, uh, of course, we like to always uh, welcome new faces that join us here, inshallah. So today is no exception. Uh, Sister Zareen, right? Sister Zareen, you're joining us for the first time. If you can just raise your hand, if you don't mind. And Sister Zareen's uh, father here, uh, Sheikh uh, 
Can I get you? Salman, yes, Sheikh Salman, inshallah, is here as well. So I want to thank both of them for taking time out. And of course, our sister Emilia. Emilia, if you can just raise your hand. Uh, she's joining us here for the first time as well. Um, and so I just want to thank you all very much for taking time out. Some of you are coming from very far places to be here today, and, and I appreciate it. So keep it going. We want to be as consistent as possible with these classes. Uh, inshallah, and we'll keep it going from there. So again, thank you all very much. If everyone can help me out, we'll put the tables and chairs away on the racks there. We have racks, and then if you guys want any snacks on your way out, you're most welcome, and we'll see everybody back on Friday. And Friday, there's no coffee with the sheikh. No session Friday because of the main session, inshallah. So please do join us. Assalamu alaikum.